The rotator cuff gets a lot of press, especially when it comes to professional athletes. We talk with Dr. John Mahalik of Lee Memorial Health System in Southwest Florida to learn that it affects more than sports stars. Well, the rotator cuff is a series of four muscles and tendons that allow you to lift your arm up and rotate in all directions. It's what connects the ball to the socket within the shoulder joint itself. When I say it's a muscle and tendon unit, it's the series and coordination of those muscles together that allow us to, for instance, swing a golf club or hit a tennis ball or throw a baseball pitch or something as simple as, for instance, wash your hair or get something out of the cabinet. When can a rotator cuff injury occur? A uh, rotator cuff disease can occur in virtually any age group. It occurs most predominantly, however, in the age group between, say, 50 and 70 years old is the most common uh, age group to tear a rotator cuff tendon. But certainly people in their 30s and 40s can start to develop the early signs of rotator cuff disease, such as tendonitis or bursitis, eventually progressing on to potentially become more of a partial tear or a full tear. Uh, the rotator cuff really tears attritionally more often than it tears as a consequence of trauma. And what I mean by that is that uh, attritional tearing would be like the frayed edges of a rope, how the rope eventually breaks down and eventually ruptures, rather than just one event breaking the rope without any fraying to it at all. So the more common form of rotator cuff tears are those that evolve chronically over time. And uh, those are the type that we most of the time see in patients between that 50 and 70 age group. Dr. Mahalik talked with us about the advances in rotator cuff surgery. 25 years ago, we had no ability whatsoever to perform arthroscopic or minimally invasive rotator cuff surgery. Typically what was done, uh, the arthroscope was utilized in cases of shoulder surgery, but it was typically used to visualize and confirm diagnoses and or take out bone spurs and or potentially clean out some arthritic disease. And then the shoulder was opened up through a large incision, damaging the deltoid muscle to visualize the rotator cuff and be able to sew it back together. More classically nowadays, uh, residents and training fellows, in other words, subspecialists in shoulder surgery, are being trained to do these all arthroscopically. And in my practice for the last eight years, we haven't done any open rotator cuff surgery, 100% arthroscopically. And the way it's done is we make three to four little mini incisions in the skin, little nicks in the skin. We place in a tiny arthroscope, about three millimeters in size, and we watch about 25 to 50 times magnification on a big screen HD TV. And what we do is use little microscopic instruments, much like you'd build a ship in a bottle to sew the rotator cuff back together. To do that, we use little anchors down inside the bone, like you would use to hold a, a picture on the wall. You can you create an anchor point by using the drywall anchor, and then something attaches to that drywall anchor to allow you to hold your picture on the wall. In the shoulder, what we do is use little screw-in or, or or tap-in style of anchors down deep inside the humeral head inside the, inside the ball, and they have strong suture attached to them that then allow us to crochet the rotator cuff back together using those microscopic instruments I spoke about. 